All right, class, first off, as always, good day. I'm glad you're here. So, we finished the French Revolution, which um, is like the beginning parts of the World War I. Okay, because this whole thing, everything we're learning about the French Revolution, uh, we're talking about imperialism right now, how Russia, Austria, Hungary, and all these places, how they formed... And it all is going to lead up to World War One. That's what this is all about. That's why I told um, the classes uh, throughout the week. That's what our aim is. So I, instead of just saying, "Hey, this is how it happened," we're looking at the build-up to World War One. And it's not just one thing that leads to it. It's several things and bad blood and things like that lead up to it so that's what i'm trying to show you guys how things got to this point um now the objective we're going to analyze the significance of the french and british joining the crimean war then we're going to examine the benefits and problems of having two or more states unifying to form one country and then we're going to create an argument on whether russia would have attacked britain or france if they had controlled the mediterranean sea now, I'm sure you're thinking, well, the Mediterranean Sea is down here. Russia's way up there. How could they control that? We're going to look at that today. All right. So, here's your warm-up picture. Now, here's the thing. I do understand that this picture um, shows a lot of stereotypes. But then again, you have to remember, this is from like the 1820s, 1840s, where, you know, they didn't care about stereotypes. So some of this stuff is kind of like racially insensitive, but again, that's the images they had, they created back then. So knowing that, keeping that in mind, what three countries are represented here? Okay, so you see six people. Each of those people represent a country. Okay, now, all these countries you have heard of you have okay so tell me which ones do you see so if you say the guy with his hands open that's what you put the guy with his hands up is whichever country you say is the guy you know with his hand on his chin is this country the lady holding the knife is this country the lady um Away from the table is this country. The guy with the pointy hat is this guy. Is this country? The guy with the white hat is this country. Okay, so that's how you would do it. Don't you put this country, this country, this country? Well, I don't know which ones are those. You, know, you could just be saying any country, and no, you need to describe the person and the country. Okay. The next question asks which of those countries then. Do you feel is going to get the bigger piece? As you can see, there's like a little cake pie thing, you know, kind of pizza looking thing on the table. Who do you think is going to get the bigger piece and why? Okay, so there you go. So tell me who, who you think and why, okay? So pause the video, write your response. Because we're going to be moving on in 3, 2, 1. Alright, so the Crimean War. This is a war between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. Okay? Now, here's the thing. I know a lot of you guys probably never heard of the Ottoman Empire. And if you did, it's probably from like video games and things like that. But the Ottoman Empire was once like, I mean, a really, really big country. Um... There was an empire that stretched for, for miles and miles, taking over a lot of countries. Now, if you watch like MMA fighting and things like that, you may know like some fighters like Conor McGregor. You know, um, I, I forgot her first name, but last her last name is Nunez. Um, five years ago, they were untouchable. Anyone, no one could beat them. Nobody. Now they've kind of lost a step and they have lost and things like that. So their invincibility, you know, look is now gone. 
that's basically what happened to the Ottoman Empire. They were feared for years, and like, oh my god, the Ottoman Empire, oh my gosh, we can't beat them. Thing is, as the years went on, people didn't test them. But in reality, their power was shrinking. So all that was scaring people was the name, and it wasn't until countries like Russia basically said, you know what, I don't think they're as big as they used to be. So they challenged them, you know. And that's what happened. Now, if you look at the top map, the Russia Empire, which is in purple, and the Ottoman Empire is in green. Where it says Crimea, that area, that that is warm waters. Okay? And if you go down a little bit more, where the green area, where the Ottoman Empire is, down where this is like Holy Land, that's the Mediterranean Sea. Now, Russia is in the north, where there's, I mean, it's... Cold, 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 cold. Usually when they make ships, it's near ice. You know, because again, really cold temperatures and water form ice. So uh, icebergs and glaciers and things like that are common in the north area where Russia is. So if they try to make a ship and launch it out, they're going to have to be careful with all these icebergs and glaciers and things like that. Um, Or even just the water itself being frozen so they need they want warmer waters because now they have to worry about that kind of stuff and uh if they had access to the mediterranean sea they're going to have access to all kinds of countries around them and this is where uh countries like britain and france who were superpowers basically feared that the russia would control the Mediterranean Sea. Because then they could get powerful either by trade or by war. Because then they could easily have access to all kinds of countries instead of then coming through land, you know, or coming from the north where all those ice water is and glaciers and icebergs. You know, now they could just have an easy access. So this kind of scared some countries, okay? And again, like I said, the Ottoman Empire, because they weren't as powerful, they became an easy target. All right, so here's my first question to you. How can a country show their strength, in your opinion? Is it by how much money they have? You know, hey, we are wealthy. We have so much money. Do you think it's by military strength? You know, the more soldiers we have, the more powerful our country is. Do you think it's being technologically ahead? Yeah, we may not have the soldiers, but we have the the newest form of weapons, the newest form of drones and missiles and tanks and things like that. Is it by how many large cities they have? You know, metropolitan areas, cities like L.A., New York, Chicago, Vegas, you know, places where a lot of people, the world knows about them, you know. Or do you think it's by... How many, uh, who, who they beat, you know, did they beat in war, the biggest countries in the world, you know, did they beat some countries that were very well respected, seen as like unbeatable, but they beat them. Or is there something else you could think of to how a country could show their strength? Okay. So let me know. And why do you believe that? So if you see money, if you see the military strength, if you see technology and all that other ones, or if you think of something else, let me know why you believe that is a way how a country can show their strength. Okay? So pause the video, write your response, because we're moving on in three, two, one. All right. 1853, Russia invades the Turkish Baltic towns of Moldavia and Wallachia. Okay? With that, the Ottoman Turks declare war on Russia. Now, they're fighting it out. They're duking it out. They're going against each other. And a year later, it kind of looks like Russia might win this. You know, because again, the Ottoman Empire is not as strong as it used to be. And Russia has a lot of soldiers. So, what happens is Britain and France fear, hey, Russia might take over the Mediterranean or have access to it. So 
they joined the war. Now, you have to remember, Britain and France are two of the biggest countries in the world. They are the superpowers in the world. So their soldiers are experienced. Their soldiers have discipline and things like that. And when they get to uh, to the Crimean War, they're looking around like, oh my God, this is just horrible. This These plans to, to attack, they're just god-awful. You know, they're easy to counter. They're just, oh my God, they suck, you know? And that's what happens. When you have bad leadership, your soldiers are going to uh, fight really bad. Same thing in sports. You have a bad coach who doesn't teach uh, the fundamentals, doesn't teach what to do, things like that. Um, then the team's not going to do well. And that's exactly what happens here. Russia ends up losing a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people once the French and the British get involved, who, again, better uh, fighters, they have more, they have better strategies, they know to, how to counter attack. And at this point, Russia's like, we want peace. We're, 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 we're done fighting. And so the Treaty of Paris was signed in March 1856, which basically said that Moldavia and Wallachia are under the protection of the great powers, which is Britain and France. So, like I explained it in class, if you have an older brother, sister, cousin, somebody, and, um, like, you know if you got in a fight, they would be right there to defend you. You know, that's how uh, Britain and France were, basically telling Russia, this is our little cousin, Moldavia and Wallachia. If you attack them, you're declaring war on us, and we will come after you. So Russia got the got the hint. Also, like I explained in the class, these are the wardrobes worn by the soldiers. And yes, guys wore kilts. So if you look at this guy with the green, that is a kilt. It's a kilt. Ah, and the men would wear this into battle. And if a swift stiff wind comes up, oh, it's brushy. Okay, that's the kind of things those soldiers would wear. So here's your next question. What do you think would be more important in a fight? A strong offense or a strong defense? Okay, now I know it's easy to say both. No, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm not asking you is both, you know, better than half. We already know that. But if you had to choose one over the other, which one is more important? A strong offense or a strong defense? Okay, now remember, if you choose a strong offense, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a strong defense. And if you have a strong defense, it doesn't mean you necessarily have a strong offense. Because that's what some people try to say in class. Oh, if you have a good defense, you know, somebody attacks you, you can block it, block it, and then you can come out. Well, what if you're not, you don't have a good offense? You have a strong defense, but your offense sucks. You might be able to attack, yeah, true, but it might not do anything to them. You know, and same thing with the offense. You know, you have a strong offense. Doesn't necessarily mean you have a good, really good defense. So which one do you think is more important to have? Okay, a strong offense or a strong defense? And explain why did you come up with that uh, conclusion? Okay, so again, I don't want to hear, I don't want to read both it's the same. I see both sides. No. You write that, you're basically getting a zero. I'm asking you which one's more important. Strong offense, strong defense. Okay. So, again, pause the video, write your response, because we're moving on in three, two, one. So, Austria. It's a country between Russia, Germany, and the Ottoman Empire. Basically, what happened is during the Crimean War, Russia asked Austria, let us go through your territory so we can flank the Ottoman Empire. Austria said no. They refused to help Russia. 
basically they were like, you know, if we let you guys through and you do attack uh, the Ottoman Empire there, they're going to fight you over here too. And then you brought us into the war and we don't want that. We don't have, we don't want anything to do with this war. Now, once Russia was defeated, they were basically humiliated how this big country could lose to such a tiny, older, you know, not as powerful um, empire like the Ottomans. So they really didn't get involved with any uh, European affairs for the next, like, 20 years. Okay, they kind of were like the dog with its tail between their legs when they know they did something bad and they're going to head down and they're just, like, looking at you like, oh, did I do something bad? I'm sorry. That's basically Russia. Okay. But at the same time, they're looking at Austria like, we could have won if you let us go through your territory. So they looked at Austria like, you know what? It's because of you guys we lost. And that's something we won't forget. We're not going to forget this. And they don't. This incident is going to play effect later on in... Um, world history okay so keep this event in the back of your mind okay at this same time a couple countries wanted to group together to make one united country so for italy the piedmont and the italian uh kingdom were like talking to each other like hey let's form together because we're basically like cousins Let's form together to make one solid country, which was Italy. And that's what they did. They united, they combined their land, the power, excuse me, to form the country Italy. Germany, on the other hand, was a little bit different. Basically, Prussia and the Northern Germany Confederate, you know, were like talking and things like that. But only one of them wanted to join with the other. The other one didn't want to. And you're going to see which one it was in a second. Now, Germany wanted to unify back in 1848 and 1849. But they couldn't. Because the thing is, the only way it could happen was if Prussia wanted it. Prussia is looking at the uh, German Confederates like, no, no, you guys suck. You know, Prussia's government was very militaristic. The king uh, of Prussia was William the First. He was like, okay, we have a big army, but we should be bigger. Because that's how you show the, the world you have a strong country, is if you have a big army. That's how he saw it. Problem was, their Congress was like, Okay, we already have a big army. Why do we need to make it bigger? We're not going to war with anybody. Nobody dare challenging us. You know, if we get more soldiers, we're going to have to feed them, take care of them, um, you know, uh, put them somewhere to stay, you know, pay for them every month, give them a salary, things like that. We're just losing money. And, and for what? For just so we look good? No. So... William the First is like, you know, I need somebody on my side, somebody who sees what I see, and he looks none other than this guy right here, Otto von Bismarck. And he, Otto von Bismarck is one of those guys who just doesn't care when people tell him things. He's like, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do, and that's it. You know, you could say, oh, that's not fair. Oh, that's not right. He could care less. And Otto von Bismarck was appointed by William I as the new Prime Minister of Prussia. Thing is, though, Otto von Bismarck basically said he realized that in politics they needed to look at things as how they were in real life and not in theory or ethically. He's like, no, that needs to be pushed to the side. You know, like when... People become teachers. You know, I get told, asked this by my former students, stuff like that. Oh, I want to become a teacher. And this book says that you should do this and this and that, la, la, la. I'm like, okay, here's the thing. Yes, that book does say to do that. Will it work? 
Eh, maybe. But it will not work 100% of the time, I can tell you that. You know, there's a thing that they say in theory that if a teacher gives students challenging work, that students will be so challenged by the work that they won't be looking at their phones, they won't be uh, distracted and things like that. And in reality, though, you guys know yourselves. If your phone buzz, are you going to check it? Chances are you are. Or you may be looking at your phone like, what time is it? Did someone text me? Did I get an alert? Did I message? Even though your phone doesn't buzz or you know anything like that or make a noise, you're still going to check. But according to that theory, if you're challenged in class, you're not going to look at your phone. So that's what I mean. It, In theory, will it work some of the time? Yeah, sure, some of the time. But will it work 100% of the time? Absolutely not. And that's what Otto Bismarck is trying to say. You can't look at the theories. You can't look at um, ethically. You have to look at how does things work in real life, especially in politics. So what happens is he basically tells the Congress, yeah, I need money for the army, you know, or going to uh, upgrade weapons, things like that. So they give him the money, but he doesn't spend the money on what he said he was going to spend it on. Instead, he used it to um, make the army bigger. And the Congress is like, hey, you can't do that. He's like, okay, sure. And just continues doing it. Um, now, the thing is, he knew that the real reason Germany wanted to join up with Prussia was not to be for about freedom and you know unity. It was more that Prussia had the power and the German Confederate didn't. And that's what they wanted from Prussia. They wanted that power. So they'd be like, well, hey, you're going to try to do something with us? Ha ha ha, we got power. You know, and basically use them. And he's like, no, we gain nothing from joining you guys. You guys gain everything from joining us. So why should we do it? So then we come to your next question. Have you ever been in a situation where someone needed you more than you needed them? If so, when was this and what did you do? So again, so something like, um, like me, I'll use a story about me. I had a truck before I had my car and people would always ask me, Hey, do you can help me, you know, move this and that, la, 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 you know, people would be I mean, tell, asking me, hey, like, hey, I remember you, remember me from elementary school? I'm like, no. Yeah, it's not, nah, 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 nah. they make some small talk and then, hey, well, you know what? Hey, I see you got a truck, you know? I was wondering if um, maybe you could let me borrow it so I can load up my stuff and move to my new house. Really? You borrow my truck? Just give you the keys and just let you borrow my truck? No. You know, so that's what I mean. Where someone needed you more than you needed them. Name of that time, what was it, and what did you do? If you have never, ever been in that situation, then tell me this. What would you do if you, again, were in a position of power and a weaker person who you know, needed your help asked for it? What would you do? And... Um, would you do it for free or would you ask for something? Let me know what you think. Let me know what you would do. Okay, so pause the video, write your response, because we're moving on in three, two, one. All right, so now we come to the exit ticket. Remember, you're only answering one of these questions, right? The first one says, would the Russians have won the Crimean War if the French and British hadn't joined? What do you think? You think they would have pulled it off at the end? The next question says, Would you say uniting two or more states to form one country is a smart thing to do or a dumb thing to do? And why? Why do you think so? 
The last question is, do you think Russia would have attacked Britain or France if they did control that Mediterranean Sea? And I'm not saying if they would have attacked that day, but maybe later on in years to come. Do you think they eventually would attack Britain and France? Why or why not? And justify your reasoning. Okay. Now, once you've answered one of these three questions, you are done with this lesson. So again, guys, hopefully you learned something new. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, I'll see you guys later. I'll see you in class. You guys take care and be safe, okay?